So good morning, everyone. We're restarting everything. <laughs> uh, then, um, yes. So we're looking at uh, circular causal geodesics. And uh, there is an equation which I'm going to read. So we uh, so the function u is as usual m over r. Uh, and the equation we need is the second derivative of u. We're assuming that j is non-zero. Otherwise, of course, there'll be no circular ones. Um, d to u over d phi square is equal minus u plus 3u square plus lambda m square over j square. And if it's time like future directed when we want, uh, well, actually time like is lambda equal one. And uh, so what we have seen that for every um, R larger than 3m, there exists a, a circular causal geodesic, right? A circular time like, not well, of course, time like is causal, but time like in this case, geodesic. I love this pen. It's uh, it writes really cool, but it uh, makes makes this little noise. It doesn't squish at least. So that's that's already something. Good. And also the question is, uh, are they stable? So, in other words, you take one of the circular time like geodesics. And you perturb it a little bit, what's going to happen to it? So, using the Colombo rule, then I tell you what the answer is. Uh, uh, so, yes, uh, if and only if uh, R is larger than 6n. So, this is the magical number. There are three magical numbers in the Schwarzschild geometry if you think about geodesics. One is 3M. Uh, it's related to this existence of uh, circular time like geodesics, but even more with the fact that R equal 3M, you have circular null geodesics. So you have a cylinder R equal 3M of, on which you have null light rays, which stay there forever. Of course, there's R equal 2M, that's the event horizon. And the other, the third magical number is 6M, uh, with um, uh, with the stability question. And uh, actually, uh, the geodesics at R equals 6m, so circular, so let me call this CT, right? CT uh, G, with, together with the geodesic. Uh, CT is G's uh, with R equal 6m are important in astrophysics. Uh, so they're called uh, ISCOs, so called, uh, what is I ISCO, right? So innermost, so this is the I, a stable, a circular, There's a C missing here. Orbits. So I so ISCO, ISCO, whatever. And the thinking is the following: suppose that you have a Schwarzschild black hole and an accretion disk around it. I don't think you can see anything anymore at this stage. Let me try again. 
So we have a, a black hole, but it could be a star. And we have an accretion disk. So uh, it's matter just on a, on a kind of a disk. Okay, so, so you have matter rotating on a disk around this object, and maybe it's a black hole, or maybe it's just a compact star. Now, uh, the stability business is the following. Uh, if you are on a circular orbit, and suppose that this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, so suppose this is Schwarzschild, and suppose that this uh, accretion disk is also built out of a circular orbits. Of course, that's a very rough model. There's no reason for the black hole to be a Schwarzschild black hole. It could be a Kerr black hole, and there's no reason for the or, uh, for the accretion disk to be uh, on circular orbits. It could be just uh, elliptical orbits. But uh, in this model, if these are all circular orbits, now the ones which are uh, smaller than 6m are unstable. Unstable means you make a small perturbation and it's going either to go to infinity or to fall into the black hole. Uh, probably small perturbation would make it fall into a black hole in this situation. So you cannot have stable orbits uh, at a radius smaller than 6m. It means that this inner ridge of the, um, of the accretion disk must have radius larger than 6m, right? Otherwise, this thing will just blow apart and uh, will fall into the black hole, right? So for on the inner ridge. Good. So this is uh, the importance of this East Coast. And uh, uh, so let's, let, let's, let's do this, let's, let's prove this. Not sure what happened here. You you can still see me, right? But you uh, hear me, but you don't see me, right? Yeah, but we saw you for a short moment. Yes, now we see you. I, uh, unfortunately, I have no idea what's happening here. So that's a disaster day today. Let's see what how this continues. So good. So we want to 
settle this stability uh, question and how do we do this? Well, we're going to make a perturbation calculation. So um, we're writing, uh, so the solution is the following, right? So we write that U is uh, U plus V and uh, V is much smaller than, than U. And U is a, a circular causal geodesic, circular time-like geodesic. So this is circular time like geodesic. Uh, so in particular, R is constant on, on this one. And we put this in the equation. Then of course, uh, second derivatives of U will be zero. Uh, so we get, well, let me just do this. Square plus v two v over d phi square is equal minus u minus v plus three. So u zero uh, u zero plus v square plus uh, m square over j square. So uh, then if I expand this, this is three u naught square plus two u naught v plus v square. And now u zero is the solution of the equation, which means that, well, this is actually zero, but uh, uh, this, even if it were not zero, it would cancel with this term and this term and this term, right? So uh, these terms are because this is a solution. And uh, so V is supposed to be very small, much smaller than U naught. So this is uh, in these two terms, uh, this is, uh, subdominant subdominant right because v is supposed to be smaller than u naught so uh, so if you have v times u naught and here you have v times v so this is supposed to be small so you just forget it so uh, in other words we get the equation d to u um, not u but v over d phi square. So this is gone. This one is here is equal minus V. This is gone minus V from this, this is gone. We get uh, six U naught V. And we forget this term, right? So this one is zero, this one we've kept, this one cancels out with these two, this one is here and three is six. So we have this. So in other words, uh, we have this equation. So V factors out, so minus one minus, minus minus is a plus. 6 u naught is m over r naught times v. So we say that this is uh, plus minus omega square. This is a constant because we're looking at circular geodesics, so r zero is constant. So we have a, an equation which says that the second derivative of V is equal plus minus omega square 
times V and plus minus because this coefficient here is either positive or negative. So, uh, so omega would be the absolute value of, uh, of, uh, of this coefficient. And so I have to be a little careful with the signs because if I call this plus minus omega square, there's a minus here, right? Which I shouldn't forget. So times minus one. So suppose that first omega is positive. In other words, we have to choose the plus sign here. So we get the equation V second is minus omega square V, which means that the solutions are uh, V is uh, A cos omega phi plus running out of room. <laughs> <laughs> this is not very elegant, but at least I hope it works. Plus uh, B sine omega phi. Right, so V is a, so this is a harmonic oscillator equation, right? So the frequencies are plus minus omega. And uh, they remain bounded. Right, so a small perturbation remains small and uh, you're happy. So it doesn't quite prove that the solutions are stable because that's a nonlinear equation. So one would need to do a little more work to really conclude. And, uh, but it, the, strictly speaking, what we have shown that this is linearization stable, right? So linearization stable, and that's what it means. You linearize the equation and you see if the, uh, small perturbation remain small or not. So it's not really stable. In fact, we've shown that it is linearization state. But what happens if uh, uh, this number is negative? So we need to put a minus here. So we're going to get the equation Uh, v second is omega square v, and the solutions are um, now exponentials, right? E to v phi plus v to v minus v phi. And then obviously uh, the b solution goes to zero as phi goes to infinity, but the A solution blows up. So a generic perturbation will have a solution which grows, right? So a linearized per so perturbation will be growing as phi increases, therefore as time increases. And uh, so what is clear that this uh, perturbed, say you have a an object on this orbit, you perturb it a little bit, it's not going to stay nearby. Right? Something is going to happen with it. And then what is going to happen? Well, you'd need to, uh, to do the full analysis of the nonlinear equation then. But at least <clears throat> in this sense, the solutions are not stable. The small perturbations will grow initially. Right? So now what happens at large times would require more. And of course, the case omega equals zero, when omega equals zero, it means that you're on this uh, R zero is six M is, uh, is um, undetermined by this method. Okay, so we just, that's a marginal case which we ignore, but for R zero larger than six M, uh, when this coefficient is positive, so R is larger than six M, you are stable. And when this coefficient is negative, R is smaller than 6M, these orbits are unstable. So this is my uh, statement about stability of the orbits.
Good. So um, let's this is your what... remark for um, this that anything on the blackboard's right. Uh, Mission Megafi in the experiment. I'm guessing. Where is it missing? Um, no, in the left. Boy wrote the solution. You wrote the V instead of omega in the experiment. Now on like just to let on the way out the solution for omega less than zero. Uh, omega, yes, of course yeah. it's omega. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so. Well, if you differentiate this thing twice, you're going to get omega square V and same with this one. Thanks, Liam. So this is circular causal geodesics. So next topic, which we are going to discuss today is, um, light deflection so this is a uh, one of the first tests of general relativity probably the first one was the advance of the perihelion and we're going to look at the advance of the perihelion today probably as well or if not today then next time and the second uh, big test which made Einstein famous uh, was the Eddington solar eclipse uh, when Eddington went to Africa, an island uh, off the coast of Africa to check the light deflection formula uh, predicted by Einstein. Uh, and so this is what we're going to do now. Uh, so the point is, of course, that uh, gravitational field bends light. I'm not sure that I remember this correctly, but I think that when calculating this, uh, Einstein got a factor wrong by two. Uh, so he just corrected it subsequently, but in the first paper about this, he got the factor wrong by two. So nobody's perfect even our great Einstein had a problem with here. So if I need a number here, new section. If I have it correctly, it should be 4.15. 4.15, okay. And the name is uh, light, uh, weak field light bending. So weak field, uh, which means that uh, uh, R is large. Uh, so U is small. So if we take our formula, which you can put a star there, if you are, if you still have somewhere in notes, uh, then uh, uh, we use star with lambda equals zero because uh, it's uh, we are interested in light 
with uh, lambda equals zero gives uh, zero order approximation or first order I don't know how to count this but an approximation you just forget the u square times you get that d to u over d phi square is equal minus u and you think well this one I can solve because this means that u is a, a linear combination of cos and sine which I'm going to write like that. You have two free constants, so you can just one is a and one is phi naught here. Uh, and then uh, we choose phi naught or just rotate our coordinate system uh, so that phi naught is zero. then u is uh, a cos phi which is the same as m over r is uh, a cos phi which is the same as m is equal a r cos phi and now this is cool because you recognize this as just being the x coordinate uh, on, on the plane, right? So everything is taking place on the equatorial plane. And this is the x coordinate on the plane. So this means that x is constant. So, uh, so if we make a picture here, this is the equatorial plane in x, y coordinates. And m is a constant, which let's say it's positive. Why am I right not here? So, and x is constant. So, this is my photon orbit. Uh, and so, if this is the distance of closest approach, Uh, then, uh, well, that's what it is, right? So uh, X is R, so we get uh, X is D. And in terms of, uh, of this formula here, so X is uh, D, so, uh, well, U is M over D. Because phi, right? Do I have it right? So this formula is telling me that x is constant. So if we call d the distance of closest approach, then x is d all the time. So we have uh, m is a d. In other words, a is m over d. That's that's what we have here. And you say, well, uh, well, of course, I should have known this all the time. And so this is Newtonian gravity. Uh, uh, in Newton theory, light moves along straight lines. And that's what it is. So in other words, uh, uh, forgetting this u square term, because that's what we did here, is just a Newtonian approximation of this equation. And of course, it doesn't make sense, because there's no equation of motion for light in Newtonian gravity. So. Uh, so yes, it is a Newtonian version of, of Schwarzschild, but uh, but no, uh, there's no such thing as a Newtonian theory of propagation of light, uh, other than just saying it follows straight lines. Good. So now the question is, what happens if we uh, make again a small perturbation? So now. Uh, what about small perturbations? So in other words, we have a, 
light, uh, which travels on all geodesics, but at large distance. Um, so let me just make sure that I use the same notation as, uh, as in the notes. So, so let me just, uh, yeah, I wrote A, so. Uh, well, let, let me call this coefficient alpha, okay? So this is alpha. So this is the Newtonian solution. So now the Newtonian solution of the problem would be U naught is alpha cos phi, with alpha is M over D. And we are now looking for small perturbations of, of this solution. So we're going to look again at this equation, uh, but making an answer similar to what we did before uh, and, and see what happens. So let me write this here. U is, uh, U not, so U naught is alpha cos phi. And I can erase everything. So now we're looking to uh, for solutions uh, of well this equation is lambda equals zero. Uh, so u is u naught plus v. Uh, u naught is alpha cos phi. and alpha is small. And we're going to assume that this is all order of alpha square. So plus order of alpha cube. And uh, so we're going to call this part U1. So this is U1 plus order alpha cube. And see what happens. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. If it works, then we'll be happy. 
If it doesn't, then we'll have to worry. Uh, well, this is an ansatz, and it turns out that it works. So uh, let's uh, write the equation that we get out of this then. Uh, D2, so that would be, that'd be a term u0 second plus V second, and the uh, there are terms which I'm going to put on the right-hand side is going to be minus u naught minus v from this thing plus three u naught plus v square plus order alpha cubed. Now u naught was the so-called Newtonian solution, so this cancels out. Uh, if I expand this, I get three u naught square plus three v u naught plus v square. Now this is order alpha square. This is order alpha cube. And this is order alpha four. So from these three terms, uh, this goes into the error term, and this goes into the error term as well. So we end up with the equation uh, v second is equal minus v plus three u naught square. Uh, u naught was alpha cos phi, so it's minus v plus three alpha square cos square phi. And of course, there are error terms which I which I've ignored. So, what are the solutions here? Well, obviously there are the solutions from the uh, this is a linear equation. So the solution is a sum of a homogeneous solution and a special solution. So so from the homogeneous solution, the frequencies are so this is again a it's going to be. In this lecture, I'm going to write this harmonic oscillator equation 25 times. So this is a harmonic oscillator equation with frequency one. Right? So this is A cos phi plus B sine phi. And I need a solution which goes in with this. So I could spend now 10 minutes trying to solve this equation by method that you have learned in uh, on your first year or something like that. Uh, so I'm not going to do this. Can you, anyone nevertheless tell me how you would go about solving this equation? No idea. I'd probably just have tried our variation of constants and see if it needs to be anywhere. <laughs> that would be the hard way, of course, right? So the problem with the variation of constants for two uh, for an equation of second order is messy. So I don't even want to think about it. But yes, of course, variation of constant formula, plug it in, and you get your your solution. Uh, but but messy. So another idea. How one does that? Well, the favorite method, of course, is just you start Mathematica and you get the result. That would be one way. Uh, and uh, but another one is the following. Uh, so you decompose the right hand side in a sum of exponentials. And uh, then you just uh, 
once you've done this, uh, for each exponential here, you're going to get a, uh, you write an ansatz with the right exponents. And, uh, and this works, except if there are, um, if there are resonant terms. And resonant terms would be terms where the frequency of these uh, individual exponentials is the same as the frequency here. In this case, we get extra terms. But um, if there's no resonances, uh, you're not going to get uh, problems. So, so let's see, how, how do we decompose uh, cos square phi in terms of uh, elementary exponents? Uh, must be a formula. Well, let me just try to work it out. So if I take uh, cos uh, phi plus phi, all right, well, cos, yeah, phi plus phi would be uh, cos square phi minus sine square phi. Uh, yeah, cos alpha cos beta minus sine alpha sine beta. And this is uh, one, so this is two cos square phi minus one. So in other words, this is, uh, let me just write this formula because we need it again today. So cos square phi is uh, cos two phi plus one over two. All right. Okay, so this is cos, so one plus cos two phi over two. Well, so the, the composing this now in, in, in exponentials is trivial, right? Because it's e to i phi and e to minus i phi. And so the frequency here that you get is two and zero, while the eigenfrequency of this problem is one. So there are no resonances. So, so you just write a solution as a, a linear combination uh, plus c cos two phi plus d sine two phi plus a constant e and you just now find the constants so that it works so let me say it again uh, because we're going to use it very shortly that if there were a term uh, which has uh, the same frequency. In other words, if there were some cos phi and sine phi terms, then the solution would have uh, terms phi cos phi. Um, so, so not in this case, but uh, in the future, we'll have a similar equation with terms like that. And uh, so some other constants f plus g. Uh, phi sine phi. If the right hand side had terms cos phi and sine phi. Here it doesn't have, so I don't have to worry about it, but very shortly we're going to see an equation where this is going to show up. So to avoid a discussion of this again. Good. So so that's the thing, right? So one one way is you just start Mathematica and you you crank these numbers out. Uh, another one, uh, you just put it by hand and crank it out. Uh, and I'm going to give you the solution because I don't want to waste time solving this. Um, so, so let me erase and...
Yes, so let me uh, just write down the solution then. Uh, so we get that V is um, A cos phi plus uh, B sine phi plus alpha square one plus sine square phi. Okay, so that's the general solution of this equation. And, uh, and that's what it is. And so if you want to understand the solution, so in other words, U is U naught plus V plus order A cube. And this is U1. And so U1 is uh, alpha uh, plus V, so alpha cos phi plus A cos phi plus B sine phi plus alpha square one plus sine square phi. And uh, we want to compare this to the Newtonian case. So in the Newtonian case, we chose a solution which was does a straight line x equal constant in the plane. So uh, to mimic this, we're going to require uh, that uh, the closest point of approach of U1, well, to the origin, which is where the black hole sits, is uh, uh, of the orbit, right? So of the orbit, I shouldn't write U1 because uh, uh, U1 is actually one of our distance, so of the orbit. Is D. And uh, so that is going to fix us those constants. Uh, now, closest point of approach of the orbit. So it means that R will have a minimum, then U will have a maximum, right? So maximum of U is. Uh, takes place at phi equal zero uh, at, at phi equal zero. Right? Max of u at uh, phi equal zero m over d at phi equal zero. So max being at phi equal zero, it means max of u one. So U1 prime of zero should be zero. Uh, derivative of cos is minus sin. Deriv uh, derivative of this cos is also minus sin. Uh, so minus a sine phi plus this one is plus cos b cos phi. And this one drops out uh, plus two alpha square sine phi cos phi. And I want to take this at phi equals zero. At phi zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is one, uh, there's a zero here. This is b. So cool, so uh, this term drops out. And uh, if I calculate now the value of U1 at zero,
I get alpha from here. Uh, I get plus A. From here. This is gone. Sine is zero. I get plus alpha square. And this should be m over d, which is the same as alpha. So a is minus a square. Minus alpha square. So in other words, here we have a minus alpha square. And I need to erase things again. Yeah, this uh, blackboard is kind of smallish, unfortunately. So it's a lot of erasing today. I should have kept this, I should have kept this, but it's just difficult to erase here without. Well, but it's, it's difficult to erase while keeping things. So, this one. So uh, our solution U1, so let me just write this again. U is U1 plus order of alpha cube. And U1 was alpha minus alpha square. If I just uh, replace the value uh, cos phi plus um, alpha square. So up to error terms, this is the solution. And now we want to understand what the solution does. Right, so. so this is a parametric curve on a plane. So one is a parametric curve on a plane. All right, so you just put u is m over r that you're going to get uh, u1 is, uh, so you put m instead and multiply by r. Uh, so r times one 
I'm going to get R times uh, M over R is M equal alpha minus alpha square. R cos phi is X and uh, you get an R one plus sine is uh, Y square over R square. Mm -hmm. So that's the equation. And if you're good at understanding what this means, uh, so, so I claim, so claim is the following that this looks like that. So here would be the Newtonian solution. So this is D. This is the Newtonian solution. And the real solution will asymptote uh, a, a curve which looks like that. So the real solution would be. Right, so, so this is going to asymptote uh, a straight line in this direction. It's going to asymptote a straight line in this direction. And, um, and there is an angle here. Uh, which I shouldn't call alpha because alpha is what we already know. So there's some angle psi. So this is the claim. That's what it looks like. And maybe I could call this even gamma alpha, because that's what which we're going to, uh, to do this. So there is an angle gamma alpha here, which is symmetric. So there's another copy of this gamma alpha here. So, for large distances, obviously, this shouldn't matter because this becomes smaller and smaller. Therefore, the solution should approximate a straight line. Uh, and this straight line will have a, a slope, uh, which you can determine by a formula which you're going to, to derive. So um, I would be very interested if someone had a simple, clean derivation of this angle from this equation, because I'm sure there is one. But, uh, but I, I didn't find a, 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 a simple derivation. I played with this a little this morning, but uh, I didn't find anything uh, very simple. So uh, I, I've given up trying to do this in a cute way. I do it the way it's done in the book and I hate it. I don't like it all the way it's done there. So if somebody comes up with a clean analysis, which shows that this equation describes such a curve with this angle gamma alpha, please send me an email and you'll have my, I'd be grateful forever uh, if you have a cute solution. So let me just do the brute force solution. And that's the one in, in my book, right? So root for solution. Uh, well, you want to have R goes to infinity is the same as uh, U goes to zero. So you want to solve um, U1 equals zero, right? Zero is equal U1 is equal uh, alpha minus alpha square cos phi. And now, what can you tell about this angle phi? Uh, if you are in the Newtonian case, you know that the angle will be zero. The angle will be zero, so gamma alpha will be uh, zero. And then the parameter which goes with this will be uh, 
phi equal pi, right? So at phi equal pi, you're going to infinity. Yeah. Pi or pi half? Pi half, right? So angle uh, in the Newtonian case, if you're following this line, uh, you go to infinity where the angle here is uh, pi half, right? So phi would be pi half. That's the Newtonian solution. Liam, do you have a nice uh, argument? Because uh, I see that you're ready to say something. Uh, no top of my head, I was mentally just okay. for a second. <laughs> okay. So the Newtonian case, right? So the angle goes to pi half or, or minus pi half, but let's just do the upper branch. It's obviously symmetric. The solution is also symmetric with respect to, uh, and so plus a correction, right? And this correction should be small. Uh, and uh, well, uh, obviously every correction is, uh, 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 smaller by some factor, but well, let's not anticipate. So gamma alpha is small, probably of order alpha, in fact, we'll find it. So, so this phi will be pi half plus gamma alpha plus alpha square one plus sine square pi half plus gamma alpha. Okay, so we want to solve this uh, this equation for gamma alpha. This is an angle at which this solution will go to you will go to zero, and therefore r will go to infinity. Now, this is gamma alpha is small. We can just approximate things. So cos pi half plus gamma alpha. Uh, let me just draw a graph of cos. So if shifting by pi half, it's going to be minus sine of gamma alpha. And this is the same as minus gamma alpha for small alpha, for, for small gamma alpha. We have sine pi half plus gamma alpha it's embarrassing but i have to draw these things i, I should remember a formula like that but i just don't so so sine is uh how does it look like something like that right so sine pi half with sh shifting sine by pi half so this is actually the same as cos cos gamma alpha and cos gamma alpha well uh, gamma alpha is small so this is about one so from here we get minus gamma alpha And from this, we get one which was here and another one which was here. So all this coefficient is two. Uh, I, I need to copy this uh, equation. And before I erase, so let's try to do it like that. Won't work. Well, you have it on your notes, but uh, just for the sake of continuity. So the equation we have obtained is therefore that zero is equal alpha minus alpha square. So I'm going to write one minus alpha times minus gamma alpha plus two alpha. Mm -hmm. So the alpha is here, the alpha square is here, 
This is minus gamma alpha. Alpha times alpha is alpha square, and I get a two. So this is a very ugly calculation, but so that should be, as I said, something simple. And maybe even if you're clever without solving the equation, but just. By simple analysis of this. Uh, open call for a nice solution. Good, so uh, this is zero and uh, so we can solve for gamma alpha right out of this. So uh, one minus alpha gamma alpha is equal to alpha. If I carry this over to the left hand side so that uh, gamma alpha is, uh, well, uh, is uh, two alpha over one minus alpha then this thing will be lower order. So this is about two alpha. Um, and so that's the light deflection formula. So I get uh, two and alpha was M over the distance, what this, the distance of the closest approach. And if I put the, things I need to make it as I uh, in our calculation G was one and C was one if I just want to include this and uh, there's a two. Can someone tell me why there is a two? Let me just do the drawing again. In Minkowski space time, uh, this would be a straight line. Now in Schwarzschild, Light isn't coming from this direction, but it's coming from a direction which is tilted by gamma alpha and exits with a direction which is again tilted by gamma alpha. So there's two gamma alphas for the total deflection, right? So this is the formula confirmed by Eddington. 
and many other experiments since first confirmed. So this is uh, the first uh, key test of general relativity just based on the Schwarzschild geometry. In fact, it wasn't uh, probably calculated in a Schwarzschild geometry by in a weak field approximation, but that's for large distances, that's equivalent. So this is uh, this formula. So let's see how we're doing with time. Uh, we have 10 minutes, so we have enough time to explain the shadow of a black hole. And that's going to be our next section. Um, and I will need Eva's input again. 4.16. Thanks. Yeah, the quality of erasing us dropping down with time here. Have to do better than this. Maybe the quality of lecturing is dropping down too, but that's. I don't see this in front of me. <laughs> Well, I would be happy if it was if it weren't, but so four sixteen shadow of the black hole. For this, we need a formula uh, which um, we had before. Uh, du. So this is a reminder. This is a formula that we derived a while back. Plus u square. One minus two u is equal m square, e square over g square. This is for null geodesics. So this is a, you take our, one of our formula at the beginning and you're going to get this. So what is this equation here? So if you thought about adding an m half here with m equal to, then this term would be the kinetic energy And this would be a potential energy. And this formula is telling me that the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is a constant. So let me call this thing some kind of name. So this is the motion. If you think about uh, your first course of mecha uh, classical mechanics. This is a motion of a particle of mass two in a potential given by this formula and uh, at a specific energy level, right? So the energy level is determined by uh, these parameters on the orbit. So the mass of the black hole, the energy and the angular momentum. 
So let's try to uh, draw this potential. So if u is equal to zero, and we are of course interesting in u positive, right? Only. So uh, use u is equal to zero, then uh, the potential vanishes. And if u is large, then the dominant term is this one. So we get here something like minus two u three in this region. And for small u, this is quadratic, right? So you have a something like that. So you have a motion in a potential which looks like that. Now, uh, this is a third order polynomial. So it could have uh, uh, how many inflection points? Uh, so it could have uh, <laughs> some maxima, right? That would be the zeros of the derivative. The, so there could be two zeros of the derivative. Uh, well, let me just calculate it rather than thinking about it. But uh, so, so V prime is uh, 2U from this. And this is minus 2U cube. So this is minus the derivative of 2U cube is 6U squared. Right? Well, I have it here actually, but yes. So it's two, uh, uh, two u uh, times one minus three u, right? So the derivative vanishes at the origin and it vanishes at u equal one third, right? So uh, zero at u equal one third. So this is of course our famous circular geodesics, which sit on the cylinder u equal one third, which is the same as uh, r equal three m. So this is u equal one third. So this is a potential. And this formula is telling me the following. Well, there is a, when the particle moves at a given energy, well, first this is, positive so the energy is always larger than the potential so in other words the energy uh, the particle can move either on this kind of trajectories or on this kind of trajectories or this kind of trajectories uh, can just can sit here can just Move like that, and there can 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 move like that. Okay, so these are the possible energy levels, and of course, if you are and with a negative energy, you're uh, never be able to get to small use. Right? So you never get to small use, uh, and so uh, we want to look at the shadow, so which we are interested in. Geodesics, which uh, are initially ingoing, initially ingoing, and returning to infinity. So we have the black hole. We're shining light on this. A star is shining light on it. So the star is far away, light comes and reaches us. Okay, so initially ongoing. Initially ongoing means that R dot is uh, negative, which is the same as U dot is positive because U is the inverse. So we look at geodesics which come up from infinity. So start with small U. So start in a region which is here. Are initially in have initial u dot positive. So let's look at at this one, right? So if you are 
at this one, uh, u dot is positive. Well, the difference between the graph and the energy is the square of the velocity. So the velocity is never zero. So this keeps going and going and going in this direction, right? So if we start at this energy level, then the geodesic, which goes with this, will start at large distances, cross u equal one, three, and then fall into the singularity. It will just be absorbed by the black hole. This one is a special because it starts, and this happens for, for every geodesic, which starts with an energy level, which is above this critical one. This one, if we start in this region and start going this, it's going to take an infinite time to reach this point. Right? It's an infinite time. Uh, well, that's, uh, I'm not going to prove this, but that's something that, you should know from elementary mechanics, right? That if you are approaching a critical point, you always do it in infinite time. What does it mean in infinite time? That if you have your, uh, if you look at the space picture, uh, the time here is the angle. So you're starting right uh, at large distances and you're circling towards r equal 3m uh, for an infinite number of time. So you're circling this sphere r equals 3m uh, an infinite number of time approaching it. That's the picture in space time. So if you start in this direction at this point, you're going to go up to a point where the velocity is zero because the total energy is equal to the potential energy. You're going to be reflected here and you're going to come back. Uh, if you started here with a positive u, well, first you'll be starting with u, which is uh, not far away. But even then, uh, if you start with increasing u, you're going to always end up in the singularity because nothing prevents, forces you to come back. Right? So starting in this direction, you always go to the singularity. This one will go to the singularity. This one will go to the singularity. This one is special because it's not going to go to singularity, but it just stays on this, well, approaches this cylinder, uh, this sphere, uh, but takes an infinite time to do this. So the only geodesics which go from large R towards the horizon and come back are the ones here. So, but the ones here have all uh, u smaller than one third, which is the same as r larger than 3m. So every geodesic that crosses r equals 3m will never come back to, to you. Right? Uh, this one crosses 3m, never come back to you. And this is the what I showed you at the video last time. Uh, if you allow me, I'm going to show this to you again. Uh, if this works, uh, doesn't. Okay, so I'm not going to show you again, but so the picture is you have the geodesics coming from large distances. Every geodesic which hits the surface r equals 3m will never leave this region, will just go to the singularity. So the shadow of the black hole is not r equal to m region, but is the r equal 3m region. So that is it for today. And um, questions? Nothing? Well, then I see you next week. Thanks a lot. See you then. Bye. Yeah, bye. 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 Thank bye. You. bye.